Hi everyone and thank you for joining us for this virtual LiveWorks presentation, Unleashing the Power of Data. My name is Blake Sims, Senior Manager, Global Retail Marketing here at PTC, and I'll be your session facilitator for today's presentation. So to really deliver the speed, innovation and creativity your customers want, it's vital that your business systems are integrated and can share data. In addition, you need real-time analytics and insights that provide data-driven predictions and recommendations to inform day-to-day decision-making. So in today's presentation, we're going to discover how to map elements and attributes from Flex PLM to other business systems, and even report on the information you want to flow between them using PTC's ThingWorks Retail Connector. We're also going to uh, explore how you can leverage PTC's AI-powered dashboards that add a new automation and visibility layer to Flex PLM, enabling you to easily access new real-time insights and produce rich data visualizations to boost your decision making. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce your speakers for today's presentation. So with us today are three members from our retail business unit, Brian Carroll, Tappan Dadwal, and Brad Thomas. And we also have a guest speaker with us today as well, Kwok Pham, who is a senior PLM consultant at Archer Gray. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Brian. Thanks, Blake. Appreciate it. Um, so ever since PLM was introduced into the into the market, it was it was heralded as a place where you could create what we call a single source of truth, meaning where all information is consistently accessible by people throughout the enterprise. And PLM has served that uh, role um, in various ways throughout various industries, retail uh, being one of them. And one of the hard things about retail is that there is such a diverse set of other systems that uh, mimic, copy, take on, uh, exchange information that's stored in PLM or ancillary to PLM and so within the retail world, we see that as we have to find a we, we PTC had to find a way to be able to extend the single source of truth throughout the enterprise. And so the session today will talk about various ways in which we can establish that kind of consistency of information without necessarily putting all information in just one system, but treating the enterprise of systems as a single solution. And so in today's world, uh, I, I call it data mania, where a lot of companies, the current state of data flow is really a mixed bag uh, where you'll have information that's manually entered uh, from one system to another, and in doing so, you might fat finger a part number to be wrong or uh, information to be inconsistent, and what you end up with, is, of course, is two versions of the truth, uh, even through your best efforts. Another is where you're doing what we call store and forward, where information is posted to some location, and that information is then grabbed by the receiving system when it schedules its pull. Um, and, and in doing so, uh, you're actually establishing situations where you end up with lost opportunities. An example would be, I've got the latest uh, imagery of product that I want to sell in market coming out of PLM, and it takes time to get into the e-commerce system. And because of that, you lose opportunities in sales. Uh, the worst of all of it is when you take information you want to actually uh, uh, we used to call it sneaker net, but the fact is you're, you have no actual way of communicating between the systems, and you have to literally uh, take that information and bring it into the others. And in doing so, you get time delays because if your ERP is not up to date, as an example, then you can't produce products for market. So in essence, the current state is really a series of time delays, bad data, and lost opportunities that we at PTC feel there's a solution uh, to address that. And so if you look at information in regards to PLM and say that there is data in PLM that I need to make available to other systems so they can consistently reference the right information, one single source of truth, uh, the data actually begins within PLM, and then what happens is that data gets pushed out. Now, it could be metadata going to ERP or an order management system, or it could include imagery that's going to an e-commerce system. And if we establish a solution that enables us to be able to transfer that data when needed, uh, based on your business rules, into these other systems, then you are, in essence, creating a single source of truth throughout the enterprise. 
And so we're going to be focusing in this session on the ThingWorks Retail Connector. But there's also the need, uh, when you consider these systems, they're also adding their own data. They're bringing their own information in that's relevant to their execution, whether it's uh, information about demographics and e-commerce or whether it's information regarding uh, specific status within order management or ERP as it relates to the, the connectivity to the supply chain in relationship to orders that you're trying to process and inventory you're trying to manage. So each one of these has their own information. And if you look at this as a solution of the landscape, uh, having all that data consistently transferred from Flex PLM into these other systems is one part of it. But what we're also going to address is the fact that you really want to be able to look at this information in a way that aggregates all this content, provides you the ability to not only look at what's in PLM, what's been transferred to other systems, but what op operations are going in uh, in these other systems and how you can enable a, almost a visceral insights into what's happening throughout the enterprise. And so we'll also... Uh, be talking about that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if you look at what we're trying to offer you uh, and what we brought to market is, is the ThingWorks Retail Connector, which really connects all of your global business systems and brings all of that data, as I just showed, uh, whether it's attributal data, imagery data, and enables that information to be triggered uh, between systems so that you have a consistent one single source of truth. So now I'll hand the uh, stage over to Toppen Dodwell. Thanks, Brian. Um, so, so what exactly is ThingWorks Retail Connector, and uh, what were the principles of ThingWorks Retail Connector? So, uh, ThingWorks Retail Connector is an integration tool, which is uh, to build integrations, to deploy integrations between your system. So, the first one was that uh, to integrate Flex PLM with your ex uh, extended enterprise systems. And, uh, and the prime goal was to avoid expensive customizations or changes. The second one is the architecture is built on a web service based connector architecture. So it is much easier to connect to a REST service, to a web service. We have extended it to an FTP. So it's, it's quite a scalable solution. And uh, what it does is it's aware of your schema, your type manager. So it makes your drag and drop much easier. The third option is uh, the traceability. So anything which happens in ThingWorks Retail Connector is, is recorded. So, so if the data is coming in or the data is going out, it is still it is stored in ThingWorks Retail Connector and it can be easily referenced by your admins for, for debugging or by developers when they're developing the integration. And the last one was the transformation is like when you have systems configured, uh, there has to be a mapping between the system. So you can write business rule validations. You can decide when to when to kick off the integration, when to stop it. It should be able to send the data to multiple systems. So you don't need the data coming multiple times. So it can broadcast the same message to multiple systems based on uh, the business need. So uh, to configure an integration in TRC, it's very straightforward. It's a four step process. The first step is to identify the source system. It's like it's the system which is going to publish the data to TRC. What is the data which is going to come into TRC? So it's defining the schema. The second step is the target system. It's where the data is going to go with the system which is going to receive the data from TRC. Again, it's, it goes to the same process. You have to define the schema, what kind of data the target system is expecting. Once you have configured your source system and the target system, then the next step is the transformation. So this is ex this is the place where you write your transformation logic, your business rules. You are mapping the systems. All our scripting can be done in a JavaScript, so it's a straightforward traditional JavaScript which is used for the mapping script. And once everything is done, then the last most important part is the tracking. So uh, I'll give an example. So if you have a simple integration, say one source system is going through a mapping and sending the data to the target system. So TRC in turn will be locking three transactions. The first transaction would be the data coming into TRC from the source system, the data getting transformed for the target system. And the last one is going to be the response which TRC receives from the target system. So from a developer perspective, if there is any issue in, in any of these three transactions, they can very easily check in TRC logs, in the UI logs, and see where the issue could be. Is the mapping going properly? Is the target system having an issue? 
is the source system of sending the data, the correct data. So, so the visual aspect of tracking is, is a very important component of TIC. This slide talks about what the value proposition of TRC is. So there are five basic uh, values which we are looking at. So the first one is the connect. So um, the idea is that we want to eliminate the data in the business silos. So um, the data should very easily flow between your enterprise system within your landscape. And um, the second one is the transform. It's, it's to improve the quality and the speed of business, business transactions or interactions. It's uh, what we have seen is once you have the integrations built in, if you want to make any change, it's a tedious job. It's it's an expensive affair. So we wanted to eliminate that using TRC. We do have a drag and drop functionality for mapping the system. So it makes it much more easier to, to build integrations and to reduce the human error via, via scripting. The third one is the cost. And um, Cost is again a big factor. You should be able to develop the integrations, test the integrations, and deploy the integrations as as cheaper and as fast as possible. You avoid expensive customizations. Your upgrades become much more easier, and it reduces your upgrade cost. Time is anyway a big factor in it. Um, uh, definitely, it reduces your development time. It reduces your testing time, but it also reduces your maintenance because most of the components are out of the box. So, uh, so in in a case where an error is going to happen, it is going to happen mostly in the scripting phase. So, so it definitely reduces your time. And the last one is the knowledge. So, if you have all your integrations going via TRC, then your your IT team does not have to go around multiple applications where the integration code is written. Everything is going to TRC, so it's much more easier to debug, to create new integrations, to look at the design patterns and build new integrations on top of it using TRC. So apart from developing TRC, we work with many integrated partners. You can see we have worked with CBX, Mesh One, First Insight. So when we say we work with them, so the idea is that we try to identify the use cases with them where Flex PLM can integrate with their application or their tool in a very seamless way. So this process is quite a uh, elaborate process. We go through their use case, we define their, we define the use cases, we go through their APIs, we say if there are any changes needed in their API to make this integration work seamlessly, and we document everything. So if a customer wants to integrate Mesh One with Flex PLM, we can give them all the information. So they don't have to start everything from zero. They have the information, they can use it as it they want to or if they need, they can make the required changes. So we are working with a couple of them, uh, like Embody, Enabled, and FitMatch. So there are more partners which we are working with. And on the right-hand side is, um, is the customer implementation, where the TRC is right now being used. So we have worked with Romanscad, which is a 3D footwear CAD system, Oracle RMS, Nuxio, NextGen, and there are some customers who have uh, the enterprise middleware available with them, so they use the TRC as an extension of Flex PLM. So any integration which needs to happen with Flex, it goes through the TRC. Now I will hand it over to QP to go over the customer use case. Well, thanks, Tapan. Um, so I, um, I'm going to go over um, a use case of a recent project uh, where we implemented uh, the TRC. Um, and um, you know, uh, Tapan explained a lot of the uh, the benefits of, of using TRC, and I think we had a pretty first-hand account uh, of uh, how it actually works, um, you know, within an implementation project. So a little bit of an overview of the project. Uh, this was for a large U.S.-based, um, you know, footwear retailer. Um, they do both footwear and apparel, but you know, most of the implementation was was around uh, you know footwear. Um, they used uh, TRC and uh, Flex PM on the cloud, so it was a purely uh, uh, cloud-based implementation. In terms of like the size, uh, about 600 plus users, um, creating about 8,000 products per season uh, and about 80,000 um, cell samples per season. So it's quite a sizable uh, amount of data that they're trying to uh, to integrate here. So we uh, we build a few interfaces um, between PLM and um, some of their business systems, and obviously the you know the main one uh, was really about sending product master data, uh, and that's also including customer facing uh, e-commerce uh, information to um, ERP uh, and other types of systems 
So there was an outbound uh, interface that was not just about um, you know creating records, but also updating records. So whenever uh, records updated in in, uh, you know, in Flex PLM, that you know gets sent through to the other systems. Uh, so you can see here uh, quite a lot of fields. Um, we had about 132 um, uh, fields in, in that particular mapping uh, that came from a lot of different objects uh, you know, within PLM. Uh, and so there's a lot of complexity there just in terms of uh, you know, uh, achieving uh, the seamless uh, integration of all this data to other systems. Okay? Uh, the, the next um, integration interface that we built was uh, for cell sample. Um, so the ability to initiate an order in, in PLM uh, and create a purchase order uh, in the ERP system. So a much smaller um, uh, you know, interface here, but still has quite a bit of complexity uh, and business rules around it. Uh, and then the last three interfaces were actually inbound uh, interface where we would uh, actually uh, update, um, you know, statuses and um, shipping information uh, as well as costing data coming from external systems back into uh, back into PLM. Uh, and so those actually were, uh, you know, quite um, uh, uh, really helpful because it uh, allowed real-time visibility to some of the processes happening in other systems to the PLM users. Um, so, so really helping um, you know achieve a fully integrated process rather than just sending data, you know, outside of uh, outside of PLM. Uh, now, in terms of the the data flow and then the different systems involved, uh, you can see the diagram. Um, so the, the you know obviously the data you know comes from Flex PLM uh, into the the, the TRC uh, where all the transformation happens, um, and uh, in this particular use case here, the the client had uh, their own um, uh, third party middleware that they use for like other integrations. So we just hooked into those uh, those middleware through the REST API, uh, and then those were actually doing uh, the work of uh, updating all the different um, applications. So a lot of those applications were actually Custom business systems. Um, so all we had to do was really uh, map to the uh, to the middleware um, to the REST API. So that was quite a simple simple task. So going to the next slide. Um, now, in terms of the the project itself, um, I'm going to talk quickly about the uh, you know the timeline. Um, if uh, anyone is uh, familiar with integration projects, um, you know typically typically they're they're, they're quite um, quite challenging. Um, one because you are dealing with multiple teams. Uh, you have the middleware team, the you know different systems teams. So coordinating um, the, the you know activities and and, and the team uh, is quite difficult. So there's a lot of um, a lot of risk associated with those projects, and 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 that you know means uh, potentially delays um, and time and cost, right? So what you can see here uh, is that this project, you know, it was actually quite large in, in terms of its scope. Uh, we were to, able to achieve, um, you know, the the, the goal lab in a, in a pretty short time frame. Uh, so you can see here the first step was uh, was the design phase. Um, you know, it took about a couple of months, and you know, really meeting with the business to understand the you know the requirements. And uh, one of the benefit of the TRC here was the ability to quickly create a um, a POC. To validate um, the architecture uh, and then uh, you know uh, some of the main principles of the of the integration, uh, you know obviously not with the full data set, but you know with a, a small set of data. Okay. Uh, once the design was completed, the actual uh, development, um, which is really the scripting and the mapping, um, took only three weeks for one resources to do. Again, once you have like the you know the business requirements and the mapping, you know defined, um, doing it in TRC is actually quite simple, right? Um, so that that really like helped uh, this phase here where we we, we uh, um, uh, able to to develop all these integrations in a really short amount of time. Now there was a gap between uh, the, uh, the the development uh, until we started testing. And what I talked about before is that we actually were waiting for other teams um, to get their um, you know their side of the the, the implementation uh, done for us to actually you know start testing. So while they were doing that, we were also able to kind of help them. Uh, and support them by quickly you know, changing things into the into the TRC. So, uh, and then came testing, uh, and uh, we um, uh, involved the entire team uh, throughout the testing process. Uh, identified um, you know about 22 issues, and um, again you know we were able to like really quickly uh, identify and resolve them you know within TRC without to you know redeploy rebuild uh, a large amount of code, right? Um, then after go live, um, you know the, the client entered into a more of a continuous improvement type of uh, process, 
Uh, and here, uh, you know, we already start seeing some uh, requirement changes and updates, and those actually, uh, you know, were quite quick to implement in, uh, in TRC as well. Um, so in terms of the, um, you know, the lesson learns and um, the, you know, the benefits uh, uh, from uh, from using TRC, I mean, as Tapan mentioned, that, like really the, the, the key one was, uh, you know, smaller customization footprint and able to um, develop those integrations in, in, in a much shorter, uh, you know, time span. But more importantly, um, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to, to have the agility um, uh, to make changes uh, is really key here, right? Um, what we noticed is that we still needed some customizations, um, you know, for like more complex validation or enforcing business rules in TLM, but that's really, you know, customer specific. Um, you know, we also noticed a couple of um, challenges with uh, the authentication, you know, because we're dealing with different technologies, different cloud applications. So that's definitely something that you want to identify, you know, really early on in the, you know, during the POC stage. Um, and, you know, again, the, the last really key benefits is that uh, all the TRC deployment and changes is independent from your regular build process. So you're not limited to uh, your, you know, um, your application releases in order to make changes. You can do that directly in, uh, in, uh, in, in TRC, so it's quite agile. Uh, and then the last point is that, uh, you know, with TRC, you have a better tool, but that does not replace the need for, uh, you know, proper business design and, and, and mapping activity, because that's really the, uh, you know, really important step as well. Uh, and I'll hand uh, over back to Blake. Thanks, Kwok. Hi, everyone. It's Blake, your session moderator. So in the first half of this presentation, we learned how to integrate your data that is spread across multiple business systems in order to get a single source of the truth. In the second half of this presentation, we're going to explore how you can leverage that one source of the truth as well as real-time analytics and insights that provide data-driven predictions and recommendations so you can make better and faster business decisions. So with that, I'll hand over to Brad Thomas. Brad, over to you. Once you have crossed the hurdle of integrating data, the challenge then becomes using it to make better and faster business decisions. McKinsey conducted a study of apparel executives for its biennial apparel go-to-market process study. A major takeaway of that study was that 92% of those executives said that they, their company struggled to make timely decisions and stick to deadlines, and that 63% of them said they were still too slow in bringing new products to market. In my 25 years in the retail analytics space, I have found that those companies with better visibility in their data and who are able to glean actionable insight from that data, well, those companies are the ones that are able to make faster and better business decisions. So let's take a closer look at the lack of data visibility. What my experience is that um, retailers and brands that have information scattered across many systems, it, it really inhibits collaboration and more time is spent on pulling data together than in actually analyzing and doing something with that data. As a result of this, you're seeing a lot of manual processes. So I, I know a lot of our customers have data that they export into an Excel file, then they do some pivot tables and VLOOKUPs on it and use it to create some analysis and then they manually enter that, that data in Flex or some other systems. So those are a lot of non-value added activities. The, the fact that some of that data resides on individual computers or in SharePoint sites and other things really make it hard for people to get the big picture um, and, and that really hinders the decision-making process. When you don't have the big picture, you can often be missing key pieces of information that will help you make the best decision. This reminds me of a old story in India about three blind men and an elephant. In this story, three blind men are traveling across country with their guide and the guide tells them that there's an elephant coming up in their, in their path. These blind men had never experienced an elephant before, so they were really excited to try to touch and feel and, and get a sense of, of what an elephant is. 
the first blind man touches the tail of the elephant and he tells to everyone, an elephant is a rope. The second blind man touches the tusk of the elephant and exclaims, no, you're wrong. An elephant is a spear. The third blind man touches the ear of the, of the elephant and says, both of you all are wrong. An elephant is actually a large fan. So each of those individuals touches a, a, a different piece of the elephant, and as a result, none of them really experienced the full view of what an elephant was. And this is exactly what occurs when we're looking at pieces of, of data. And I'll use an example here uh, of being able to, to, to do a line assortment and be able to plan for an upcoming season. So you have pieces of information. Some of it's coming from Flex PLM. You might have data like First Insight data that's, that's telling you sort of the voice of the customer. You could also have sales data from historically from your ERP system or an Excel spreadsheet or, or so on. And you might even have customer review data for similar items that come from your e-commerce site. And what we're able to do is, is by taking all of this information together, you're able to then build a much more comprehensive view that helps you be able to make decisions about how many uh, of specific types of, of products you should should incorporate in the next season, be able to look at, at order quantities, pricing, all of this thing. And, and really the, the net impact of this is being able to make a, a very solid and sound business decision. Now I'd like to show you a specific use case that, uh, that incorporates bringing data in from multiple systems. And in this example, it is a visual line collaboration tool that, that we built. So with this tool, you have the ability to, to review all of the items that are available for a specific season. You also have the ability to, as you, you know, click on specific items, you have the ability to take information from that uh, about that item. So, for example, be able to see 3D uh, images uh, for that product. You could also be able to look at things like sales history, or even if it, if you're a, a wholesaler, be able to look at specific accounts and, and what those accounts have ordered in the past, and even maybe details about how that shoe has been used in this example for a Black Friday doorbuster. You also, you know, in this instance, we've also incorporated uh, customer review data about that shoe. So as you're as you're clicking through, you'll be able to see what people's comments about, you know, why it, it, it may or may not fit, and so on. And then finally, to be able to take information from Flex PLM, which is your current forecasts or your current units uh, by region, be able to look at the prior history of that and do some what if scenarios. So, you know, what if I lower this price, uh, the MSRP, to $100 in, in North America. It then decreases the gross margin percentage to 72. And, and, and what this enables you to do then is play what-if scenarios. And once you're comfortable with the, the forecast working with your regional salespeople, you can just hit publish, and it'll update that data within FlexPLM. So this is an example of a dashboard that pulls together information across multiple sources of data that enable you to be able to make a more comprehensive and sound business decision. Now I'd like to go through another use case that should be familiar to everyone that's on this uh, webcast, and that's around identifying product development delays. Most of you all have a process in place, whether you call it a critical path process or a buy ready process, that takes a product from the initial design for, through planning, material development, product designing, costing, and, and other processes to the, the final stage where you're ready to place an order or you've confirmed an order with a supplier. And what you see here is an example of that process from a supply uh, from a uh, large retailer that that I'm working with or I have worked with in in Europe, and you can see that there are 21 pro, uh, uh, process steps, and that some of those process steps are done in, at the product level, some at the colorway level, some at the material level. Those processes encompass costing, forecasting, 
things like uh, you know material sample requests, approvals, measurement sets, spec sets. And so it's very comprehensive and touches just about every different business object within Flex PLM. And you know, their express need is to be able at a high level to see this specific set of information, to know where products are in that process, and then be able to drill down and see what tasks are missing and why. Furthermore, some of those individual tasks were very complicated as far as the logic, and you can just see an example here where the lab dip sample status needs to be passed, but in order for it to be passed, it has to have a sample approved for the current season for a variety of different material types, but it did not need to have a lab dip if that material was vendor sourced. And the lab dip sample is only uh, good for a couple of seasons. So if, if it's been approved for the current season, only if it, the season requested is that season or a season validity attribute uh, is, includes that season in it. So you can see that these kinds of critical path or, or buy ready processes can be extraordinarily complex and require data from multiple sources. The great news is that all of the information you need to do this logic and the logic from the other criteria exists in your current systems. So if you think about each one of those tasks, there's data in Flex PLM or in your other systems that can serve as a proxy for telling you that that task is completed. So for example, if one of your tasks is being able to have your target costing complete, you can be able to look and say, you know, what are the components that, that say that target costing is complete? Retail price needs to be there, target cost needs to be there, and target retail margin percentage. And if those three things are non-zero, then we know target costing is complete as a task. Same thing with being able to look at things like samples. So if you have a task that says that your samples have to be approved, and in those instances, there needs to be an approved sample that is a fit sample and an approved sample that's a testing sample. And if both of those things are approved, then your samples are approved. So let's take a look at what this could possibly look like in within a Flex PLM environment. So here I am within a, um, a line sheet for the apparel women spring 20. And I'd like to get a, a big picture view of where I am uh, across the board in my um, critical path process. So uh, we have the ability to embed ThingWorks dashboards within the drop down menus and uh, various places within Flex PLM. So if I click on, on this link, it takes you directly to the critical path dashboard. And what you see here, you know, maybe I, I want to be able to look just at apparel products. And, and as I do this, it tells me for each one of the, um, of the criteria what percentage. So I have 100% of my products are in design phase, 100% the target costing has been completed. Uh, my, primary, um, my primary material has only been approved in 35%. So not only can you sort of look at individual tasks and the processes or the percentages are complete for those tasks, but you can also see what percentage of your product are, are within each stage. Then once uh, I wanna really wanna be able to start drilling down and taking a look at specific products to see you know, why, uh, you know, which products have completed which tasks. And, and you can see here, that the long crepe vest is, is a no for regional forecast. So if I go down to this, uh, to this here, I can see this long crepe vest still does not have uh, the US forecast units, UK forecast units, or EU units, and, and doesn't have the, the MSRP for the UK or the EU market. So what I can do is then go back into Flex just by clicking here, and I can just go in for that product and be able to um, update those values so I can go in and put, put in that information that, uh, that is missing. 
furthermore, within within the dashboard, so as I'm looking through some of these things, I could be able to see, you know, for, for certain products that, uh, you know, let's take a look at the samples. So for this uh, button down top, there are samples and it's not passing the, uh, the uh, 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 or it's passing the samples approved process because I do have a sample, two samples that have been in the approved, approved fat, uh, status, one's a testing sample and one's a fit sample. So across the board, I'm able to bring in things like image page data, measurement data. So if you know this product passes the measurement set because the measurement status is in production for this product, uh, it passes some of the the image requirements because uh, because there are design cards and cover pages available. So what this enables you to do is take a very comprehensive look at what where your products as a whole are in the process and then be able to drill down and be able to take a look at specific products uh, as you're going along. I hope that this example and the others I've shared with you give you a sense of the art of the possible. Specifically how getting data out of your systems and organizing it can really make things easier for your end users. So now I'd like to shift gears and talk more around actionable insight. And specifically in this instance, I'm talking about machine learning or the ability to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to help you understand some of your critical business issues. A perfect example of that is really being able to look at how long it takes to, to develop specific products. So going from the product uh, created date to an order confirmed date and ultimately being able to shrink that. So in the previous section, I talked about you know, individual tasks, you know, um, are required or milestones in order to go from product created to order confirmed. And the beautiful thing about Flex PLM is that you can use timestamps for different changes in product attributes to be able to, to tell how long it took a specific product to pass each of those milestones. And the overall goal with the machine learning or with this analysis is to be able to shrink down that, that amount of time, the total product you know, time to market by analyzing each of those individual pieces that make up that time to market and finding out why they take longer amounts of time to, to, for some products or shorter amount of times for other products, but then to use that analysis to actively shrink the, the overall uh, time to market. So what I wanna share with you is a specific example of a case study from a, a large retailer. And in their specific example, their first milestone was, uh, our task is cr product created to uh, a spec being created for that product. And both of those activities have a timestamp and we were able to calculate across about a uh, 180,000 products that that on average took about 45 days. When you drill down and start looking at the distribution of all of those products, you know, yes, the average was 45 days, but the vast majority, probably about 60% of those products uh, took less than five days. And so that 45 days is really being stretched by the, the products that you see on the right that, you know, 13,000 products took more than 200 days and, and you know, it, it's not insignificant. So if you can identify the patterns or, or why certain products take that amount of time, you can start to be able to chip away at the 45 days and keep moving that to, to a shorter time period. So here's what we did. We took the data from Flex PLM and from other systems and started thinking about what could be causing this variability. And you know that variability can cross multiple business objects. So for example, the product itself has attributes that could influence the amount of time that it takes to produce uh, a spec, the category, the product type, the cost of it. So a more expensive product might have more details and more specs involved with it. 
Whether something's new or a carryover, the number of materials, the type of materials, how it's constructed, uh, the sustainability score. So if you need something that's going to be more uh, um, sustainable, it might take longer to design uh, against that. So the product obviously has a lot of influence there. Same thing with the, the team. So take a be able to take a closer look at the product manager. How many products are they managing? How many years have they been a product manager? The designer, is it someone in-house? Is it someone externally? The sourcing office, so where is it located? How many products do they have to source? And, and then there's details about the season, the season type, is it fall, spring, how many days are in the season, how many days did it take to plan the season, the overall number of products, and even the supplier has, has uh, certain things available uh, or that could be causing this, this variability. So what, what we did was in uh, ThingWorks Analytics, we took all of this information uh, about specific products and tried to model specifically against the number of days it took to create a product spec. And here's what we found. So if you take a look here, this is a, an output of ThingWorks, uh, ThingWorks Analytics. Uh, and in this instance, it is just a regression model um, showing the validity of, of the model. And on the x-axis here, you see the, the actual number of days. And then on the y-axis is what the predicted number of days. And you know, for those of you that are a little bit rusty in your statistics, um, um, essentially R-squared measures uh, how accurately the, the model predicts uh, the real data. And anything over a 0.3 to 0.35 is considered to be a very valid predictive model. So in this instance, you see an R-squared of 0.73 so this is a highly predictive model. So this is the first output that you would get from uh, ThingWorks Analytics. The next output is then signals. And what signals do are, are to look at all of the attributes that were included in the model and start looking at the relative importance of those attributes. And so the, the person that created the product in this instance was the most important attribute followed by the department, the spec number, and then what you see highlighted here is the product type. And within the product type, you see over on the right that against an average score of 45 days, there are certain types of products like vests that are significantly, take significantly longer. In this instance, it's 126 days for vests. And then you go down and see you know, underwear, home product, and, and then down at the bottom, at least on this list, are socks. There are many more products that go all the way down to the bottom, but, but you get a sense of A, what products or, or what attributes are most critical in the overall model and specifically values of those, of those, pro, of, of those product attributes that, that, uh, that may be higher or lower. Once you have this information, then ThingWorks Analytics produces something called profiles. And what it starts to do is take a specific attribute and a value of that attribute and uses it at a starting point and then starts combining other fields or other attributes and values of those attributes. And it starts building out a profile. And what you see here, you know, take a look at profile number six. It started out and said spec number three is, has an average, uh, an average of 76 days. If you add the, the product season carryover equals yes, it jumps to 126 days. If the product designers are not from the e-commerce site, uh, then it's, it jumps to 177 days and, and so on. And what ThingWorks is doing is building models that then can be used to predict what, um, you know, uh, predict in this case, the number of days. So at a high level, what we're seeing, here's the number of days for all data is 45. If you look at the summer season, it jumps to 63. If you look at the summer season where it's the primary source, it does a little bit better, 57 uh, days. If it's the non-primary source, it's a 77. 
Then if that product is summer season, non-primary sourced and designed internally, it gets a little bit better. But what you see on this last line is really what's critical is summer season, non-primary, designed externally. This is where you're seeing some of those products that take 200 days or more, 215 days in this example. And so you've seen an outlier that, that now helps you be able to understand what's happening. And, and if you can figure out a way to rectify this, this outlier, then, then what you're doing is being able to support and improve your processes. Finally, what I'd like to share with you is how you can then take the model that is the output of ThingWorks Analytics and be able to bring that information back into FlexPLM. So to close the loop within FlexPLM, as you're building out new products or new materials in the next seasons, you can take that model and run the attributes of those specific products against the model and it'll come back and you can bring into FlexPLM and it will predict for, uh, predict for you the number of days it'll take to do a certain thing based on that model. This use case allows, demonstrates the value of how machine learning can provide actionable insight. And in this instance, it's being able to help an organization understand the sources of risk for what, uh, what products may take a little bit longer to, to develop, which products may be at risk for, for making it into market on time. And specifically by understanding which products have that risk, the organization or retailer can begin to start developing processes or, or, or strategies for mitigating those risks. That could mean taking the at-risk products and beginning those products earlier in the, in the development process. It could be noticing that certain uh, product categories take longer in the summer, so as a result of that, maybe reassigning some resources to, to hit those products uh, more heavily. And then finally, one of the issues uh, that the many retailers have that are using FlexPLM is really being able to predict completion times for their calendar tasks. And what the machine learning models enable you to do is, is actually put in more accurate estimates for that. So I'd like to close by providing just a, a brief summary of my section of the presentation. First is, you know, I can't stress how important it is to be able to improve data visibility in order to, to make the jobs of, of your end users uh, that much easier to, to do. Second is the value that you can get out of advanced analytics and machine learning and be able to help understand some of those key business challenges like time to market or improves, improving costs or margins and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, thank you for your time on the presentation today. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Blake who is going to talk to you a little bit about some of the other sessions that you can access during this LiveWorks uh, uh, online conference. Thank you again and uh, have a good day. Thanks, Brad and team. Uh, a great presentation there. Uh, before we end this session, I'd like to remind our attendees to check out other FlexPLM focused sessions during this virtual LiveWorks event. Those sessions can be found in the LiveWorks on demand content library. Also, a quick reminder to follow our FlexPLM social media channels to stay up to date with news, blogs, events and more. You can find us on Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. Finally, a big thank you to Brian, Tappan, Brad and Kwok for making this such an informative session. And a big thank you to you, our audience, for watching. We hope you found today's presentation valuable. Thank you.